So we spent last week talking about a bunch of different corpora and what you can do with those uh, different corpora. And this week we're going to focus mostly on um, the WordNet corpus and a couple of other ones and thinking about how do I do merge a corpus that I have with the data that I might use later. So learning about these will help you understand what's available to you later to um, do sentiment and all this other kind of stuff that we're going to work on this semester. So there's a words corpus and it's often used for spell checking or finding unusual words in a text. Um, and I've used this corpus as a way to do spell checking. I think there was a really popular package called Hunspell that also uses it for spell checking. But just to remember how to think about functions, we might define a function that inputs some text. Okay, so it might be really long, it might be short. And <clears throat> it's going to pull out the vocabulary in the text by looping over. So it's going to lowercase all of our words and, um, and only pull out the words, leave out the numbers. Create a list of those that is the unique list, so these are all the types. Okay. The English vocab is pulled from the words corpus, so it's NLTK corpus dot words. Words is the name of the corpus, and then dot words one more time is the pull out the words function here. And the really nice thing about having two lists here is you can actually subtract lists. This is really neat and it will provide you with the words that are um, essentially not in our vocabulary dictionary that are in the text. And then it will return those. So this could be useful for spell checking because if it's not in the text it might be misspelled or it could be useful for, um, for finding the like weird words in a data set. And so if I tell it to print the unusual words um, from Sense and Sensibility, uh, the first 10 anyway, what we see is it prints the name of a, the, one of the locations. Okay, that makes sense. Abort is a word, though. Abilities is definitely a pretty common word. Abused. Abuse is. So one thing you should notice here is that the words corpus, corpus does not have every form of the word. It has probably the lemma. So reminder from last week, the lemma is the head word or the root word. So for this to actually be pretty useful, we'd have to maybe pull off and create the lemmas from our input corpus. Okay. And we'll talk about how to do that in the next chapter. Um, it's called stimming. Okay. Um, and then if we do the same thing for the NPS chat corpus, remember that this one is one where uh, it's a bunch of people chatting back and forth in like an instant message kind of style. So there are going to be a lot of random things here. Um, like abortions is a real word. This is probably the word about, it's misspelled. Uh, this is aborted but misspelled. Uh, here's actually misspelled. Here's a cross. So this one gives us more of a spelling issue. Um, but I think it's important to notice here that all of these are spelled correctly and the issue is that it doesn't uh, the words corpus does not have all the different conjugations or combinations of morphemes in the word. Okay, so those are affixes. Um, <clears throat> but the nice thing is that there's another corpus that has stop words. Okay. Stop words are high frequency worker words is what we've been calling them. Things like of, the, a, you can look at the list here. Lots of pronouns, this, that, am, were, be, being, have, but, because. Okay. Um, that usually are excluded. Okay. Now, one of my favorite researchers, Penna Baker, has a really great book called The Secret Life of Pronouns. And so maybe we don't want to exclude pronouns because they are actually very interesting uh, in some uh, linguistics analyses. But in general, uh, we want to exclude stop words. Okay. So we can tell it to subtract stop words from our text. And uh, it is in multiple languages, so not just English. 
Now, what I can do with this words corpus, it's just kind of fun, is um, play a game. Yes. So let's say uh, you would save it as something, um, you know, my stop words, and then you could tell it to, to exclude a list. So you could do something like, Oh, hold on. I will have to hit the button to rerun everything. I'm at pronunciation, content, fraction, do, 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 do. I was here. Okay. Oh, where did this come from? I think we were about to skip that slide. Did it just decide to like not include this? That's really odd. That slide was not there a second ago that I saw. Yeah, let's make it a new slide. There we go. All right. So if I save this as my stop words, right? Um, then what I could do is do my stop words minus uh, a list of things I wanted to to include. So uh, you, your we unsupported. I'd like to. I think you could subtract them. I think I might have to something like that effect. I think maybe it's that the my stop words is not a list. Let's look. The type or class. I would get R and so yeah. So minus list. Okay, something to this effect, because obviously we did this exact thing over here, where we subtracted these two. Okay. And I'm just having a brain fart. But that's what I would do, is I would just subtract them out. I've been writing an R all day, so it's probably part of the problem. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Um, so the slide that I missed a minute ago, so great timing for asking me a question, we could figure out how much of a text is are the stop words. Like, why is it important to exclude them? Okay. So we pulled out the stop words. Okay. We said, let's find this content that we're interested in. I'm not sure why this is red. Um, but let's find a wor the words that are in our text that are not in our stop words. So this is another way to to subtract things out. Then figure out how much is left after we've excluded our uh, stop words. Okay. So how long is the content um, given the text? And so what we see is that 73, 74% of the Reuters corpus is uh, non-stop words. So here, this is removing stop words. So it says everything that's not in our stop word set, return that. And so the ratio of uh, non-stop words to stop words is 74%. What that means is that 26% is stop words. So 26% like of a text, think about that, full quarter of text are words that are like the and a of because. So we often will exclude them to just make sure that we're analyzing the content words, um, the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives and the adverbs, instead of prepositions, conjunctions, and pronouns. So now let's talk about cheating at Scrabble. <laughs> and so one thing that we could do is, um, I love this, uh, this game Alpha Bear. Oh my god, it's so addictive where you are basically creating words from letters you have on a board. Um, but you could also play this with Scrabble and think about, like, okay, if I have these letters, what words can I make? So here are the rules. Um, you can only use each letter once. It has to include the R. Uh, you can't include plurals ending in S, but S isn't even on the board here. Um, and so how many words can we come up with? 
And so I just made a frequency distribution of my puzzle letters. So all that does is just count how many of each letter, because V is in here twice. Now, oh, apparently I didn't change this from last year. Remember that this word here, for blank, in our puzzle letters, this could be anything. So I made cheese in this example, but it could be for letter, it could be for L for letter, but it could be anything really. So for um, each letter in puzzle letters, print out the letter and its frequency. So this is a nice way to print a frequency distribution. I see the V's twice. We're going to say that R is obligatory because, meaning it's required, because the rules of this particular Scrabble game is that you have to use the R. Okay. We'll pull out all of the possible valid words. If we had a Scrabble corpus, this would be better. And then I'm going to print out the words, okay, so word for word in our word list, and so it has to be part of our valid words. If it's greater than six characters, only to keep it printable on one page. And there's an R in it. Okay. And it matches our frequency distribution. Okay. So this is a nice loop that loops over every word in our word list and checks three things. Is it longer than six letters, just to keep our output count short? Does it have an R? And is it made up of the letters that we have? I think you see we come up with um, 10 or 12 here. And some of them I'm like, these are words. <laughs> like, like, that doesn't look like an English word, but OK. <laughs> so these would be all the words that we could use to, to cheat at Scrabble. Okay. And this is what a lot of those online Scrabble cheating websites do. <laughs> uh, not guilty at all, <laughs> in the least. Um, <clears throat> when you're trying to. Uh, figure out spellings for words. Okay. So this is a fun use of the words data set. Uh, another data set we can use is names, and we'll use this one a lot when we get to chapter six where we're doing um, uh, classifiers. Now let's say we're trying to, um, well, the example we'll do later is we're trying to predict if a name is male or female. And this is close to my heart because I get Mr. Buchanan all the time. <laughs> And then it's just kind of like, are you, are you serious? <laughs> like my name is spelled the girl way, um, but when people try to predict which option it is, some for some reason it comes up as male more often. Um, and we'll talk more about that, like I said, in chapter six. So we're gonna save the names corpus. Now the names corpus has two data sets: a female set and a male set. And so let's just see which ones are in both. Okay, and this actually runs off the page, there are so many. Um, so we're going to save the male names, then save the female names. Loop over uh, the names, or the words in, in male names, and only print it out if it's also in female names. Okay. And so this is another way to do list overlap. Right, so this is essentially, if you're an R person, it's like an inner join. You know that these are in the same um, uh, they're bo in both data sets. And we would say these are ambiguous because a male and a female both have those names. Uh, and there are a lot of them. You can even just look at me of this list real quick. 365. Okay. Out, oops, sorry. Out of how long the male names data set is, 2,000. Okay, almost 3,000. Our female data set is 5,000. So overall that length is 400 or so. So we see that there's a good chunk of those that are ambiguous, meaning they're in both data sets. Looking at word list dictionaries, because okay, everything in this section is a, uh, sets of words. All of the corpora that we covered last week are text, meaning they have like lots of discourse, different 
um, newspaper articles, different uh, chat data set. We talked about Reuters corpus, we talked about Brown. So all of those are like sets of discourse. These are all uh, corpora that are sets of words. And the, both are necessary because sometimes we want to exclude stop words like we just showed, or sometimes we want to know how we should pronounce something. Okay. Um, and so a lot of what Siri or OK Google or any spoken system like Dragon or something, um, what they do is they have an underlying phoneme corpus, and that depends on the language that you pick. So on my phone, I have a uh, one year, like many years ago at this point, we were driving to Chicago from Missouri, and um, one of my students was like playing with the um, option. Let me make sure my sound is off. Okay, good. My, one of my students was playing with the option on Siri where you can make it sound with different accents. So it has different versions of English in there. So it has someone that's speaking British English, American English, and Australian. <laughs> And so we all changed it, and so now my Siri still talks to me in Australian English, which just makes me laugh every time I hear it because um, it's very like stereotypical. Uh, but if they had it in like Southern, I would totally change it <laughs> because it would be more fun to hear my own dialect. Right? Um, and so the way that that works is an underlying phoneme pronouncing dictionary. Okay. So the CMU dict corpus is a list of entries of different ways that something can be pronounced. Okay. And so there are 133,000 different words and their phoneme sets. And I'll just printed a couple of them here. So fur, like the tree, right? the, the codes here, the little codes, are re related to the International Phonetic Alphabet. But notice some words have multiple pronunciations. So this is fire and sort of um, fire and I, I can't even, I don't even know if I could do this. Fur, basically fire, like there's no er at the end of that. Okay. Um, and so correspondingly there's two for fire er, arm and firearm. I can kind of do it. Um, it's so it's it allows us to think about the different accents that we might find and how we might pronounce things. Um, and so my funny story for this phoneme set is that my high school band director, uh, like song, um, "Great Balls of Fire," he would always like to run up and yell, "Great Balls of Fur!" And I was just like, "That's F U R. I don't understand." <laughs> so. Uh, the d difference in accents are, can be represented here. So we could use this to have a, a speech a text to speech system that sounded more realistic based on an, like if you picked an area of the country. Um, however, each this is this pro provides us an example of a Python question. So each entry in the data set is, a tuple, okay. and within that uh, tuple set is a single entry and then a list. So notice that this is a tuple, and remember that tuples are nice because they're immutable, so we couldn't accidentally change something here. And they're also nice because they can be embedded tuples in tuples or embedded lists. So this is a single one and then a list, which is, I guess this is a list of one. So here they're pairs, but remember tuple does not mean pair. So when you have that kind of information, if you just tried to loop over one thing, it would be like, what are you doing? Okay. So what we're going to do is loop over two. So it's expecting a pair here. And if you want to make this even more explicit, you can say, I'm expecting this kind of tuple set. And that should still run fine. Yeah. Um, and this, this is not necessarily the parentheses, but I think for me, it helps me understand that this is like, I'm expecting this tuple. So a word and its pronunciation. Okay, so we're looping over both. Um, and then now I can use both of those. So if the pronunciation list size is equal to three, 
So we're going to look at words that have at least three different pronunciations. Okay. Um, we're going to save those as one, two, three, because we're expecting three. Okay. Uh, so break down the pronunciation into three different little phonemes. And then just for fun, we're going to print the ones that start with P and end with T. Okay. And just print the middle phoneme. So for words that start with a P phoneme and end with a T phoneme, what's the middle phoneme? Right. And this is really useful for instances where maybe you're trying to transcribe live text and um, you're trying to sort, uh, trying to, not live text, live uh, talking, like a spoken thing, and you're trying to figure out a word that um, is either been uh, an loud sound happened or phoneme deletion where they just you just can't understand the phoneme and so you could write a program that would go through and find the outer phonemes and pick the most probable word based on the the um, uh, frequency of the inner phoneme right so here there's quite a bit right so um, this would be kind of pate. This would be pat. Um, this would be pate again in a different way. This would be um, ae. Really interesting. Pert, right? Pete, um, eat again, but it's just spelled differently. Pete, third time, spelled differently. <laughs> Pert. So we can see in pet um, that there are quite a few words that start and end with a p and a t phoneme, and so you would have to know the context of the sentence to disambiguate that. So as humans, we do this all the time because there's uh, environments are usually very noisy, um, like the cats chewing on the box, right? Or um, there's a loud crash, or the TV's on, or you're just not listening. <laughs> it's also an option. And what you, in your mind, do is you use the, the words around it for context to help fill in that phoneme. Or you just go, what? Right. Um, and so to begin to write a system that might understand what words are, even if it's a noisy environment, you have to um, uh, first figure out what all the options are and then use context. So if you've ever used text-to-speech on your phone, what you might notice if you're paying attention to what and you're watching it translate for you is that often it will pick the most probable or the most frequent combination but then after it's kind of gotten three or four words past what you've just said it might switch because context has kicked in so that's what makes these systems really cool is that they're using multiple sources of information but underneath all that is this sort of pronunciation dictionary Another thing we can do this is look at for rhyming words. Um, this might be good for games if you're making um, games. So di dyslexia is a, a reading problem. Often it manifests as children not being able to spell, um, but it is actually usually a, it's technically a reading disorder. And one of the problems, one of the ways that you diagnose or you notice it uh, in children normally is that they can't. Uh, rhyme because since it's a reading problem what we think is some of the issues are um, phoneme uh, an inability to break down phonemes so you can see the word but you can't break it into its phoneme its con constituents um, so also we're trying to create a kids game that has um, play like does rhyming and so it says what well, rhymes with cat and to know the answer you can use this pronunciation data set for that language and dialect to find other words that rhyme with cat, hat, fat. Okay. Um, so to do that, we might pick some syllables, and this would be uh, ix, phonics, right? And we'll say, okay, let's say, let's find the word in our word pron pronunciation set uh, if the pronunciation has these syllables at the end. So this is a sneaky way to say it's the last four syllables. Okay. So we're saying from the end minus four, so moving up four, okay. up to the fourth one. So it's the last one, the second to last one, the third to last one, the fourth to last one, but not 
the fifth to last one. But remember that Python starts at zero. Okay. Um, so we're kind of counting backwards here. Is the syllable set? Okay. Like, see, there's quite a bit. Cryogenics, conics, clinics, chetniks, or chetniks, um, calisthenics. <laughs> And so these would be all the words that would have that ix, nix, phoneme at the end. Now what this demonstrates between these two slides is what's called the many-to-many -many problem. So I like to talk about how English is dumb. It's, um, it's not really dumb. It's just kind of a funny way to talk about what are some of the issues that we'll deal with when we're writing programs to, to process language. And uh, many languages have this problem. English is just especially gross at it. Um, and so the many-to-many -many problem is this idea that there is one spelling with many pronunciations. We saw that with fire. Um, fire, fire, right. Uh, so one spelling to many pronunciations. And then the other way around, one pronunciation to many spellings. Um, and so the F phoneme has like seven different ways to spell it. Spell words of, uh, I'm sorry, fish, photo, cough, and puff all have the same F phoneme but are spelled differently. Um, and then, let me see here, back to your question. Is it frozen or have I just not moved? Oh, it is frozen. Thanks. There we go. So the many-to-many -many problem is the fact that the phoneme to spelling is not one-to-one. -one. Sometimes it's many-to-one, sometimes it's one-to-many, and so it's called the many-to-many -many problem. Come on now. Another way we might do this is to use dictionaries. Okay. So dictionaries are a, um, and I can't remember if we've covered exactly how dictionaries work. I feel like we've talked about them a little bit, but um, either way, dictionaries are exactly like they sound. They are a, a set, a special type of object that is not a list or a tuple um, that have an entry and a definition. And we're going to call these keys and values. They've got a list of unique keys. Remember, in the dictionary, you can't have the same word twice, and the, the different values that can go with it. If you try to use something that does not exist, it will get a, you'll get a key error. But we can um, add things to the dictionary to help. Okay. So let's say we're going to take that pronunciation dictionary and we're going to save it. Okay. Oh, that pronunciation, um, yeah, it's a dictionary.dict means it's in dictionary format. And I could print out the options for fire. It gives me two little lists here for fire and fur. If I try to print out the one for blog, and I zoom out a little bit, you'll see that you will get this error because it doesn't exist. Okay. So I can add blog to my dictionary. Um, because that is a valid word now, and then we could tell it to print out. Now we've got the little double list action going because this denotes that it's the key, and the key, I'm sorry, this is the key, this is the value list, but then we need to tell it that that whole thing is what's going into it. If you do one set of, um, I think it'll blow up. Let's just test this theory. No, it doesn't blow up. So I don't remember why why it's double. The book did double, that's why. Ag. Um, not entirely sure. Don't have an answer there. But you can do one bracket too. So what about translation? So machine translation is one of the most important things that have come out of the sort of uh, revolution of computational linguistics and natural language processing. Um, and so there's a corpus for correspondingly for that. It's called a Swadesh corpus. And it has common words across many languages. 
and the languages are identified using um, ISO language codes. Okay, this is super important because we have a, a consistent set of rules on what language is what. And so we can um, look at the file IDs here. Here, let's just do this. There we go. Woo, okay, that worked good. So here are the file IDs. So here are all of the languages that are included. Obviously, this is not a lot because there are many, many languages, but they are some of the more popular languages. EN is for English. Uh, ES is for Spanish, French, uh, UK is British English. Uh, I don't remember what all these are. Uh, Dutch, for the Netherlands, there's also BE, which I think is a different form of Dutch. DE is German. Okay, so you can look up their ISO codes to figure out what language is what. Okay. What I'm going to do is create a dictionary that is uh, the entries, or I'm going to create French to English here, which is the entries of French translated into English. Okay, so it's, we're just going to pair these together. So what I end up with is tuple sets. Okay. So je is the word for I, tu is the word for vous. Uh, I'm sorry, tu and vous both translate into you, um, singular. And then they interestingly have it as thou, although vu is a formal form of you in French for people you don't know. Um, and then it keeps going, right? So this is the pairs of words and how you translate them. And so we can create that into a dictionary. So by having it in this like tuple set that will automatically translate it into the keys and the values. So we're just going to make that into a dictionary. Now this is really nice because I don't have to loop over. So why, why is this better than a list is what I'm trying to get into. Um, now I can just say translate this word. Okay. Before in this loop, this uh, list tuple set, we'd have to loop over it until we found that word. Okay. This is just much faster. Okay. So translate shin, it's dog, and jeter is throw. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I can also do this for German to English and then Spanish to English. And the really nice thing is this update function. Okay. And the update function slaps all of them on the end, okay, with one exception. So just put a note here. Um, it essentially combines the two sets if there are any overlaps in the, di in the dictionary. So let's say for, for some reason you have um, uh, the same key. right? So let's say uh, there's one a word in French and Spanish that would be different English words. Uh, I don't know. So let's say you, in both data sets you have the word cheese, okay. but it translates to different words. It will overwrite. When you use update, it overwrites any keys that were already there. And if they're not there, it just adds them. Okay. So this is one issue with the update function is it doesn't really combine if there are multiple keys, it doesn't really combine the values, it just overwrites with the newest value. Um, some other data sets before we get to WordNet here, and my song and dance on how much I love WordNet, um, is Shoebox and Toolbox. Okay. Those are really great data management systems for linguistic data. It's ways to create linguistic data, and you might use it as XML format. XML format is a structured uh, hierarchical kind of format that uh, allows us to use um, lots of different uh, coded entries. So for example, the toolbox data set, we look at this specific entry for this um, language. This would be the word, and there it's a tuple, check it out, tuple. Okay. And it ends here. So the second, it's like a tuple set of ka, and then the second piece is all the different pieces of that. So this is truly built like the Merriam-Webster, right? So here's the word. It's part of speech as a verb. Um, I don't remember what PT stands for. It's gloss to English, meaning it's translation into English. It's for gag. Okay. Um, uh, date it was entered. 
examples of it being used, a translation of the example being used. So this would be um, just sets of, of characteristics about this word. And we wouldn't want to use a dictionary, a literal dictionary in Python terms for this because we can't use the same key over and over again. Okay, so in this one it's better to have a tuples with embedded lists of tuples. So it's kind of nested structure. And this is why XML might be kind of good or JSON format um, because that allows for that hierarchical kind of structure. Like everything here is nested under this term. All right, WordNet. I love WordNet. It's my favorite. Okay. WordNet's also available online and in more than one language. Okay. So, WordNet. Blah, 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 blah. Use it. Okay, the website is um, old, but this is what WordNet looks like. Okay. So we can pick our favorite word we want to search for, which mine is clearly cheese. Okay. And what we see is essentially its dictionary definition. So we can see that cheese is a noun, and then we could click on these to look at the, the entry for the literal cheese. Okay. Um, this would be a very old form of some version of cheese. It can also be a verb. Um, and to to get away or to stop, which I've never used. So let's look at that one. So here we can look at it since set, and I haven't talked about any of these terms, so they won't make any sense, but it breaks down and so can slowly you can slowly see all of its pieces. Or you can here and click show all. This gets really hairy though, and it shows you like every piece going on here. This is almost unread unreadable though, so I find it easier to work with in Python. Sorry, I'm on the wrong, this one. There you go. Because what WordNet is, is it's a dictionary, like a Merriam-Webster, not a, Py not a um, Python dictionary. It's built in a hierarchical structure which gives us so much cool power to do interesting analyses. And so uh, here's an example of what WordNet might look like. So the, the topmost entry of WordNet is entity. So generally the words in WordNet are um, nouns and verbs. So to, it, to me its biggest limitation is the fact that it's structured hierarchically, which means that lots of adjectives and adverbs don't, aren't really represented in this form. Okay, no, no stop words, really. Um, but let's think about the word motor car. Okay, this is an odd, this is not something that people, at least in American English, use very often, but it's a type of motor vehicle. But another type of motor vehicle might be a go-car or truck. Okay. A motor car might be a hatchback. Okay, these are just, we just normally call these cars, right? Hatchback, compact, gas guzzler, other ones. And then hatchback might include uh, something like my car, which is a Honda Fit. Okay. Um, so it's broken down in the sort of category structure. And this allows us to think about what's called polysemy and synonymy. Okay. So polysemy is when words have multiple meanings. Synonyms or synonymy is when words have the same meaning. Okay, so different words, same meaning. Polysemy is one word, multiple meanings. Okay. Um, and so let's say we have this sentence. Benz is credited with the invention of the motor car. Benz is credited with the invention of the automobile. As long as people agree that these two sentences say the same thing, that means that they're synonyms. So if we can exchange one word for another, they're synonyms in meaning. Um, and the function to look at this in WordNet is called synsets. Okay. So we're going to import WordNet as WN to keep it short. And what you can do is say uh, wn.synsets is the function and show me all of the uh, related words to call a motor car. Okay. And it actually only returns one entry and that's a car. So let's break down what's in here. When you see an entry, 
That's why I said looking at this doesn't always make a lot of sense because it is in its entry structure. But when you see an entry, it'll show you that it's um, the word itself. It's part of speech. So if car is actually also a verb, it would have V here. So that's a car dot N for noun. And then the definition number. So here that's number one. Um, excuse me. We can look at the sin set for car as well. Um, so we asked for the sin set of motor car, and it said it's car. Okay, great. So let's now look at the sin set for just car here, and this specific version of car. Because if we did just the word car, we would get um, all the different um, options of car. And I don't want the the dictionary, uh, dictionary making up words now. Um, I don't want the whole car in one, car in two, car in three. So just show me the first word. So to get just the word back, you use the lemon names function. So here, this gives us the sin set of this particular definition entry for car, and not all the definition entries for car. And then the lemon names function gives me just the, the part of the word back instead of the, also the part of speech. So synonyms for car include car, okay, uh, the other forms of car, okay, auto, automobile, machine, and motor car. And this is how the thesaurus works. Okay, so when you ask for synonyms of a particular word, this is, this is how it's working in the background, some form of this. Um, the dot definition function allows us to um, look at the dictionary definition. So for car, the definition is a motor vehicle with four wheels, usually propelled by an internal combustion engine, which is a lot of words to describe something that we just uh, imagine so naturally. Right? Um, I also can print examples. Okay. So here's an example sentence. He needs a car to get to work. And there are even more functions here, but these are kind of the main ones we're going to look at as sin sets, uh, definitions, examples, and then some options for thinking about the structure of the data. Okay, so let's look at those. Um, so lots of words have multiple sin sets. Um, and this is part of our ambiguity problem and polysemy problem that we've talked about. So if we look at the sin sets for just the word car and not car noun number one, you can actually see that the word car has um, has a sin set for noun number one, noun number two, three, four, and cable car because it found any instance of the word car. Okay. So we've got four versions of car and one cable car. And I can print all of those out. So for those sin sets in this one we just ran, print out the names. Okay. So for the first definition of car, we've already looked at this one, but for the second definition of car, this seems to be like train car, right? Car, rail car, railway car, rail road car. This is gondola, okay, so it's a different kind of carriage vehicle. Elevator car, so elevator. Okay. And then cable car, which its only sin set, only relationship is the word car. And so this is where we might need to understand disambiguation. Like, which version of car should it be? Okay. So how do I know which one to recommend where it's for you? And that might be based on the words around it. All right. Because WordNet, WordNet, WordNet is hierarchical, that means that we can exploit that hierarchy by looking at what's above it and below it. So um, for all of these, I don't know if I would just tell you to make yourself a list so you don't get confused on which one's which, um, because the names are very similar. <laughs> so a basic level category is the, the level you're at, essentially. So the, the most general name for something might be car. Right? So everything is a car. Everything with four wheels running on the road is a car. Okay? A superordinate is a more abstract level. It's above it, so super meaning above. Okay. 
And the word for this is a hypernym. So hyper meaning um, higher is the way I think about this. It's not a higher nym, but hypernym, kind of close enough sounding. Nym just means word, so that's where synonym um, kind of comes in, so similar word. So a hypernym is the word that is more abstract above it, okay, it's sometimes called the superordinate word, which here might be vehicle, one of them. Okay. A subordinate or hyponym, meaning lower than, um, and if you know if you know anything about um, like uh, medical terms, right, um, having hypothyroid is not enough, hyper is too much, so above and below, okay, normal. Um, the subordinate words are more co concrete or more descriptive, so like I have a Honda. But we can move where the basic is. Right, so we could say, okay, well the basic level category is now going to be vehicle, what's above that and what's below that. So it's not generally people consider this the most general name, like dog, right? So animal and then beagle. Um, but it doesn't have to be. You can pick anywhere to start at the basic level. So I'm going to save the sin set for car. Okay. Um, if we can see, it shows us that it's just saved as a sin set. So saving it doesn't really do anything useful. We have to then pull data out of it in a specific way. Okay. So we're going to say types of motor cars and pull out the hyponyms. So hyponym, remember, is lower. Okay. So I'm going to tell it to print the first one, and that is the sin set of ambulance. So ambulance is a um, type of motor car. And then to print them out in a useful way, I'm going to say, give me the lemon name okay. in each of these sin sets in types of motor cars um, for those lemmas in the, the sin set dot lemmas. So the way this is kind of like a, a nested loop. Okay. And what's happening is I want the names back. Looping over this, the sin set options in types of motor car, but there's several names in each one of those, so I have to tell it to pull those out. So pull out the limas and then print them out. Okay. And what we can see now is all of the things connected to motor car, underneath car essentially. And what are all the types of cars? Is effectively the question we're asking about. Okay. We've got Model T, SUVs, Stanley Steamer, <laughs> which makes me laugh because <laughs> in my head is a vacuum, right? Um, Pace, prowl car, police cruiser, police car, patrol car, minivans, wagons, right? Taxis. So now we can see all the different types of cars in this data set. And if we move up, we would say hypernyms. So the hypernyms for our um, our car data set is motor vehicle. Okay, that makes sense. So a car is a type of motor vehicle. And if we move up more, it might just be vehicle. Okay. And then we can also use this function hypernym path. Okay. So hypernym remember is above it. And this is how many ways can from the top can we get to this word? So we have the dictionary and it's structured in this sort of hierarchical format. And it's how many different roads can we take and end up at car, which is our motor car variable. Okay. So there are two paths between entity, which is the topmost structure of WordNet to car. Um, you would think there would just be one, but there's actually two. And that's because wheeled vehicle is classified both as a vehicle and a container um, for some odd reason. And so I could say that there are how many paths are there? Well, there's two. And print the um, names and the sin sets for each path. 
So path one, path two. And so we start at entity, physical entity, object, whole, artifact, instrument, container, wheeled vehicle, self-propelled vehicle, motor vehicle, and a car. Okay, this is all pretty much the same until we get to instrument, then it's conveyance, uh, vehicle, wheel vehicle, self, motor, car. Okay. So wheeled vehicle is under both vehicle and container. Okay. Another thing we can do is look at the length of these paths. So um, from which word is more specific than another word. So if the path length is longer, that means it's more specific. Um, which is on another slide here, but we could get the most generalized hypernym. Now I will tell you that this is not a very useful function because the root hypernym for all words in WordNet is entity um, because it is the top of the tree. Okay. So this function to me seems kind of useless because it's always entity. Mm. Okay. Um, but the nice thing about uh, the, hype, the path function is that I can tell how specific a word is. And words that are more specific are generally less frequent in a, in a dictionary or data set or, or corpus um, because um, we tend to use more basic level names. So hypernyms and hyponyms are iso relationships, meaning um, we can move up and down in a hierarchy between them. Okay, so a car is a motor, motor vehicle, or a beagle is a dog, and a dog is an animal. If we want to think about features, instead we can use what are called meronyms. Okay. And meronyms are broken into two parts. I'm not entirely sure. I totally always get the difference between these, but part meronyms are things that are a part of something, okay. whereas substance meronyms are things that make up something. Okay. So, um, a part of a zebra uh, would be that it has stripes, legs, and tail, but the makeup of a zebra would be like blood, skin, cells. That kind of stuff. Um, another option is a holonym, uh, and this is it's kind of an interesting. It's essentially if it has a set name, right? So a group of zebras is actually called a dazzle. Things I did not know until I read the book. Um, but a group of trees is called a forest. A group of wolves is called a pack. So that kind of thing. So let's look here. We're going to print the send the meronyms the parts of trees, okay? and so that is burl, crown, limb, stump, so these are the, the trunk, the, the pieces to tree. Substance meronyms though are in my, what type of wood it is, so it might be heartwood or sapwood, and a group of trees is called a forest. Okay. So this gets at the, 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 a different entry in the dictionary. Rather than just the, the word itself, this now gets into its pieces. Uh, and these are has a relationships or is made of. Uh, of. Okay, instead of is a, we're now has this, you know, it has a trunk, it has limbs, or is comprised of, is sometimes what people say, or is made of. So let me think about the word mint. Mint is a very strange word because it has many definitions. It's not the word with the most definitions in WordNet, but it is a bunch. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull all the send sets for mint where it's a noun. Because okay. mint, uh, mint has many definitions where it's not a noun, like um, coins. Okay. Um, and we're going to print the send set name with a definition. Okay. So we've got a batch okay, or um, a bunch of mints. We've got the actual plant. Okay. Um, we've got the set of plants. Right? We've got the fact that it could be the leaves are sometimes called mint. It could be that candy like a peppermint. 
Oh, or it could be the physical location where the money is made. So we can look at all of its different definitions, and this is only when it's a noun. Okay. So here are all of its um, synonyms and their definitions. And then if I look at synonym number four, right, the leaves, I can see that the parts are comprised. So these are all inter interconnected is the, the point here, where the, the, the remember, part uh, holonym, right, is the, the thing that it has. So mint has, number two, this um, plant with these flowers. Okay. Uh, so number four here is part of the plant with the flowers. Right? This is the leaves. And the substance right, is related to number five, where it's um, made of this mint oil, okay? the candy. So uh, the interesting thing about WordNet is that we've talked a lot about it being a hierarchy, but once you get into like the definitions and the features and the parts and the substances, they're all interconnected in weird ways. So this is not quite so much a hierarchy anymore. They're like linked over here, linked over there. So the parts and substances are, um, are more of a network than they are a hierarchy. Um, so the purpose of this is now we can use entailment. Okay. Entailment's a, uh, a function where um, you might, if A is true, then B is also true. And so if you're writing or read or having it read a text and you ask a question like, um, did, this was that paintings example, right? So the thieves stole the paintings. And then you would say uh, the paintings were um, were gone, right? So stolen means it's gone. Okay. So this allows us to kind of say, you know, if this one thing is happening, this other thing is also happening. So if someone is walking, they are also taking steps. Okay. If someone is chewing, more than likely they're probably swallowing, although this is not perfect, right? Because you could be chewing gum. Okay. But generally, if chewing, then swallowing. Okay. Um, and then, then it becomes really very interesting because you you get, um, or if eating, then chewing and swallowing. Sorry, I got a little distracted. But then there's a fun one here, if tease. It could be then arousal or then disappointment. <laughs> so this shows you here that there are two different, very different definitions listed there for tease. So it could be that the next step is upset or it could be the next step is aroused. So... Um, this also will show you how words have shades of meaning. Um, and then my favorite thing to do with WordNet is thinking about similarity. So I told you at the beginning of the semester, I think, um, that my research is on semantics and definitions and terminology and best measurement practices for semanticity. And what WordNet allows me to do, for nouns and verbs at least, is calculate the relationship between words and think about how words are rela more related than other words. Okay. So if two words are in that same hierarchy on the same branching path, they're probably related. Right. And we can calculate the distance between words in our hierarchy. So now this function is really handy. The root hypernym run is not so handy because it's always entity, but Lowest common hypernym finds the, the, the most, the closest link between words. So if I had um, cat and dog, it would find the closest link above it, right? Hyper, rumor above. So that would probably be animal. Um, and so that finds the place where they intersect. So to do this, we're going to pick a couple words. A right whale, which I've actually never looked this up what this is. Let's look it up. Why not? Trucking along here tonight. Ta-da! A right whale. It is a type of whale. Okay. We're going to save its sunset to do this. An orca, okay, which is a different type of whale. Orcas, this is like sea roll, chamu. 
a minky, which I'm assuming I'm saying it might be a mink, but I assume that you pronounce the E. Okay. Here's another type of whale. Ooh, fancy. Okay. So we've got three whale types. And then tortoise, that's a turtle, okay. and novel, which is a book, okay. um, which all of you know. I know this, but so we're, we're getting three words that should be very related because they're all types of whales, although they're not exactly maybe the same family of whale, but they're all still big fish in the sea. Okay. Um, oh, are they fish? They might be mammals. Hmm. Okay, big ocean creatures. Let's go with that. Uh, tortoise, um, which is a reptile, and novel, which is totally something different. So the way you do this is you take one of them, which here is called right, and then you use the lowest common lowest common hypernym function and put in the other sunset. So you basically take one sunset and tell it to look at the other sunset in a match. And the lowest common hypernym between a right whale and a minky whale is a baleen whale, okay. which is this other one, which looks kind of frightening. I think I feel like we got <laughs> we got like all the scary pictures. Can we see a, a more zoomed out view? No, just them eating things. <laughs> so that's the, the lowest common denominator between those two. Okay. Between a right whale and an orca, it's actually whale, so we have to go higher up in the hierarchy. Okay. Between right whales and tortoise, which are two totally different things, we actually have to go all the way up to vertebra, vertebrate, okay. um, which is quite high in the hierarchy. And then, of animal, anyway, um, and then between a right whale and a book, which these things are totally unrelated, you can see here that it went all the way to entity, which means that they're not really related at all because entity is the end of the, of the, the top of the chain. So that's kind of neat. Um, this allows us to see uh, also to definition wise where, where each one is, but this to me is not the most useful function, it's just kind of cool. A more useful function is to actually count how far away um, they are from each other. So the min depth function um, tells me how, the, the, how far down it is. So the more specific something is, the more um, the lower it is in the hierarchy. So this is essentially how many nodes from entity is this. So you see the entity is node zero, so there is no depth there, it's at the top, and this follows Python's rules where zero is one. Okay. Vertebra is pretty high up on the hierarchy, it's eight deep, whales 13 deep, and baleen whales actually 14 deep. Okay. And that is way more useful because now I can take this and essentially do that to, um, except it won't, it doesn't like that idea, but essentially this is the, the, the structure that we're building here. So we're figuring out um, what the synthet is okay, and then testing where it's at. Okay. Um, which there's a way to combine them all into one, it's just kind of confusing. That's essentially the idea. Um, so now I know how specific each term is. Um, and I can tell that right whales are more related to baleen whales than they are orcas. Um, or, I'm sorry, back up. Boop, 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 boop. There we go. So, um, right whales and minkies are lower in the chain, they're more related because, than right whales and orcas because they have a lower depth and a more specific. Um, <clears throat> But we could also convert this into something a little bit more tangible um, because the obviously the depth function has an end, but it is not in a standardized set. So if we want to, we can standardize this and use path similarity. This is how much they have the same path, um, and that scores from 0 to 1. Okay. Uh, and so 0 is like... Uh, no relationship. You almost cannot get a zero. Like it, it because entity connects them all. Um, you pretty much 
can't get zero. I think this is the bottom 0.04. Um, so it does not, it asymptotes at zero, but it does not touch zero. And one indicates it's the exact same item, okay? which you pretty much would only do if you got right past similarity right here, then you would get one. Um, how much are these the same? So how much do they have the same paths? Um, so from right to Mickey, we get 0.25. So maybe not as similar as I thought. Um, it is more connected to that than Orca. Let, way less connected to tortoise, and between tortoise and novel, tortoise is winning by a little bit because they're both animals. So this gives us a, um, a number. It's almost like correlation. It's not a correlation um, because it's not calculated in the same way, but it's a similar idea to correlation. So we have a bounds on our relationship, and we can know that things close to zero are basically unrelated and things closer to one are more related. Excuse me. Okay. And there's a couple more, more than a couple, <laughs> a bunch more options that are in the uh, WordNet uh, repertoire. So the Leacock Chodoro, I think it's how it said, is a, a really popular measure for similarity um, that returns a score uh, based on how similar the sense sets are. Um, so it measures their sin sets and their past similarity and picks how deep they go, essentially. My other two favorite ones that I have used is Resnick, or Resnick. Um, and this one's based on information content. So this pulls from a sort of entropy theory and looks at the least common subsumer. So uh, that is the... Um, hypernym, so how deep is the, the most, the word that they're both related to, the lowest common denominator is what they're kind of saying, and how much information do we get by knowing one, if we know one, how much information do we have to know the other. Um, and then the one I use all the time is Jan Conrath. Okay. And this one is, um, is similar to, to Resnick here in that it returns a score of, of very connected for zero up to like 32, I think, for not um, not connected at all, and kind of gives you a measure of, of relatedness. And then a lot of people convert that into a, a similarity score, so a zero to one kind of similarity score. Okay. But all of these are pretty popular, and they're all built in. So there are functions for each of these, like dot jcn. All right, so that ends, why is it so tiny? Anyways, that ends uh, chapter two.